Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 124. Today, we are switching back into true crime mode, and we will be talking about the case of Danelle Lane and Michelle Wilkins. Pretty intense case out of Colorado that we have wanted to talk about for a long time because we remember it when it was happening, you know, from just watching it on the news. Yeah, it's a crazy, crazy case. It and, is. Uh, yeah, it's definitely disturbing at some parts, and it has to do with Craigslist as well. And mm-hmm. I'm sure many of you have out there have had some, you know, sketchy encounters or, yeah. you know, sketchy contacts with people selling things on Craigslist. Mm-hmm. I know I have definitely had a few, you know, questionable meetings with people on Craigslist. And mm-hmm. yeah, this all ties into this case today. So that's what we're going to be covering. But we do have a couple other news topics we want to talk about as well. And also, before we get into that, you guys are launching a new podcast, if you guys haven't heard. We are, yes. If you didn't hear our Q&A episode last week, Janelle and I have decided to start our own podcast. Mm -hmm. It's called The Sesh. It's going to be coming out on August 9th. And if you didn't hear our explanation last week, we're going to be doing a bit of a variety show, is what kind of what we're calling it. Um, We're going to be covering everything from mental health to personal topics advice, you know, more in depth, things like that. But also we will be still covering a bit of conspiracy here Mm -hmm. and there, some current events. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you guys will really like our first episode actually. Yeah. I think it's going to be really exciting. Um, We have some interesting stuff to talk about, so it'll be fun. Well, it's good too, because it's going to be, you know, a nice balance between, you know, my show lights out how dark that is to, Mm -hmm. you know, mile hires kind of somewhere in between. And then you've got the sesh, which is going to be a lot lighter Mm -hmm. and, you know, a little bit easier to digest. I feel like than some of the stuff we cover on these other shows. So Kendall and I keep coming to the conclusion that we really like want to have fun on Mm -hmm. this. Not that we don't have fun on mile higher and stuff like that, but it's, it is like a different mood when you're talking about heavy cases and stuff like that. So we want to be able to have more lightheartedness, more, you know, joking around, but still be able to talk about serious things as well if we want to. So it'll be Mm -hmm. really, like you said, a variety show. Yep. I'm super excited about it. I just can't wait to open up to you guys in a more personal way and, you know, just be able to leave you feeling uplifted versus bringing you down every week with some of these topics. I mean, we do talk about some intense things for sure. So that will be coming out on August 9th. You can follow our YouTube channel or subscribe to it. It, The link is in the description box. And make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Our um, handles are, well, the sesh handle is the underscore sesh podcast. Yes. So be sure to follow that for updates. Yeah. And and there'll be a trailer out soon and you'll be able to subscribe on iTunes and follow on Spotify. So we'll definitely keep you guys posted about that. So the first news topic we wanted to talk about today is actually something that happened in the past couple days uh, regarding a kidnapping that really went viral online that a lot of you actually hit Kendall up about. So I'm going to let her explain what happened with that. Yeah. A bunch of you started tweeting me yesterday morning about this girl named Hannah Potts who was kidnapped on Friday. So very recent, but what was really interesting about it is she had recorded a Facebook live video, uh, which is really, really scary. So we'll go ahead and play some of that right now. Mom, are you there? Hello? Mom, if you can hear me, please say something. I really need to hear your voice. Something's happened. I I was out taking those pictures of animals. And this this, this guy came out of nowhere. It was the same guy I saw us in in the maroon car. He, he, He grabbed me. And he, and he pushed me into a truck. Where is he going to take me? Mom, please. I think he had a thing. He, um, he's black. He's, he's about um, Jerry's height. Uh, the Jerry I w- or work with. And um, his, his voice is, is deep and... The way he called me, baby girl, it just shivered down my spine. I don't like it. Please, Mom, if you're there, can you please just say something to me? I'm in a room. There's a 
little light four room four walls you know okay. I don't think they know I have the phone so you gotta tell you you gotta tell the cops everything that you gotta show them this video so maybe they can find me and um I don't know he uh where what did he say what did he say he said something about Ohio so pretty intense recording there I really freaked a lot of people out after i heard it i felt really upset but a lot of people started bringing up right away about how could she have her phone and have service and be able to get on a facebook live but not know where she is when she would have gps or she could have called 911 or called her mom it was just a little confusing you know um but you know you never know the circumstances so i was like okay I, you know, made a tweet about it, tried to spread awareness about it, and it spread to like 3,000, you know, retweets. A lot of people saw this yesterday. And a couple hours after I posted it, her family posted that she was found. Actually, the police first posted that she was found. Not only was she found, but it turns out she faked this entire thing, you guys. Wow. What people will do these days for attention is just beyond me. Right? Unbelievable, right? So her family has made multiple posts on Facebook apologizing because they, you know, were spreading awareness. They really thought she was gone. It seems, I mean, the details are still coming out. There will probably be more to come out in the future, but they believe or were being told that she was at some type of rental, like an Airbnb type situation. And her family did not know where she was. She wasn't at their house. And so they were freaking out, um, you know, trying to get, they put their phone numbers out there. They made missing persons flyers and everything. Um, so then they made a statement saying that it was completely made up. They in no way condone or understand her actions and they're completely heartbroken and embarrassed. Um, they're very upset about how she blamed this on a black man. Uh, and they hope that no black man with a maroon colored car was actually targeted due to the lie that she told in the video because the FBI ended up getting involved in this. Oh my God. Yeah. Meanwhile, Big there's no, no. real things happening right. out there that they're not paying attention to because mm -hmm. this girl is, I mean, do, do we know why she did this? Has she explained what her reasoning was? So her sister first put out a statement too, talking about how she wants nothing to do with her. She disowns her. She's dead to her. I hope she's prosecuted to the full extent. And then another family member, I'm not sure if it was the mom, someone in the immediate family posted that, they know that this was all made up by her. It was pre-planned. She recorded the Facebook Live days before even posting it. And the reason she was doing it, to answer your question, was apparently because she's writing a novel. Wow. I know. So writing a novel about what herself or? I don't know what she was going to do. Maybe she thought she would just be missing and like write a, like almost kind of like a Gone Girl situation. Is this you like know, a, remember that movie? Yeah, or like Bruno <laughs> Orgas. That? Oh, the, yeah. Where he like disappears. And I mean, yeah, she's staged her disappearance. But I mean, <laughs> so she's just going to miss like return and be like, oh, I've escaped my kidnapper. Here's my book, by the way. Go out and buy it. It's at Barnes and Noble. I don't know what she what thought. She, it just makes but, no sense. I mean, it's just so disgusting. How her, old is she? Um, I believe. Uh, I don't know, actually, how old she is. She's a teenager. Um, she's 23, actually. Sorry, she's not a teenager. 23. 23 you fucking know better so let's hope that yeah she gets prosecuted <sighs> oh, she's to the gonna full get in of the law. i mean yeah you're taking valuable resources away from people that actually need help for one and two mm -hmm. what's wrong with you yeah, i mean and you're upsetting people too i mean yeah. all these people taking their time to share her story and on the discord if any of you aren't on our discord it's mile higher discord we'll leave a link below but we were all talking about it over there and like everyone was really upset and scared hearing this voice recording i mean to go to that extent to to put this fake message out i mean she wanted this to become like a trending thing i don't know what she thought maybe she didn't think she'd get in trouble i don't know really really stupid um but yeah she's gonna need some mental help and some jail time to deal with all of that seriously think about and think yeah. twice about doing that again because yeah hopefully that's a warning to other people that are thinking right. about doing shit like that well they got to set an example because mm -hmm. i feel like this you know, faking things to get attention is just getting out of control, especially mm -hmm. online. And everybody's trying to figure out a way to go viral and try yeah. to drum up attention for themselves or whatever their, 
you know, purposes for doing it. And it's just, it's dangerous. And, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's going to get to a point where it's like the boy who cried wolf, you know, it's going right. to get to a point where we, we don't believe people that are posting things like this. And what happens if there's somebody that posts a video similar mm -hmm. to it and we all just kind of scoff at it and be like, Oh, it's just, you know, it's a hoax, whatever. Meanwhile, they actually need help. And you know, the mm -hmm. authorities aren't responding to it because they're not, they've, you know, made this new rule that we don't respond to things online and, you mm -hmm. know, you know, to calls that there's not an actual call to police. So we're not going to mm -hmm. respond or investigate it. So not, not saying that that's going to happen, but if it mm -hmm. did happen, that would be a, a terrible, you know, place to be. So I don't know, hopefully, hopefully she learns from this because that's very, very dangerous and horrible to do. And I mean, for her to get so much attention when there's so many cases that just get no attention at all that actually need it. Um, the only reason the police and the FBI probably really stepped up in this case is because one, because that call was so scary, but also because there was so much public outcry for, you know, in the first couple days that this was going around. So just sad waste of resources. And it's honestly just disappointing to have to even report on that. But anyway, what else we got this week? Oh yeah. So there's some this new, bitch again. yeah, just Lane. That's not her name. It's Ghislaine <laughs> Maxwell. Lane. So there's a couple updates um, in that case. And what we found out this past week was that the judge has ordered for extremely confidential Epstein records uh, to be released to the public. Now, I don't believe this has happened yet, but there's over 80 confidential documents, which includes details of Ghislaine Maxwell's involvement with Epstein, which will be released to for everybody to see hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the New York senior district judge, Loretta Presca, apparently the documents include flight logs from Epstein's private jets, details about Maxwell's sex life and the transcript of a seven hour, 418 page deposition that she gave previously, which includes extremely personal and confidential content. 418 pages. What the hell's wow, in that? That's a, a lot, lot of shit, lot dude. Of fucking mm -hmm. shit in there. And of course her legal team is trying to appeal this, but to me, this seems like there's going to be some major bombs that drop in and there's got to be some stuff in there in that deposition that we don't know yet that could confirm a lot of different mm -hmm. beliefs and things that, you know, the public is speculating about with this case. And yeah, cause I mean, it's, that's going to be really mm -hmm. damning to, to see what's in there. Mm -hmm. Also this week, Trump was actually asked about, you know, the whole situation, what he thought about it. And he gave the weirdest <laughs> response. <laughs> I was shook. I, I don't know if he was confused or what, but he replied and basically said that he wasn't following it too much and doesn't really know the situation very well, but that he wishes her well. This which, is an accused sex trafficker. Which is just, <laughs> just shows <laughs> where that guy's mind yeah. is. I mean, he's so... I don't believe that for a second that he didn't know what's going on with her. No, dude, you're involved with her. Yeah. He has There's pictures with her. Literal, tons. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me that you're, you don't have your legal team involved in that whole Epstein case because in trying to, you know, separate mm -hmm. you from it. He's just playing dumb in order to, because he knows if he's like, he knows the media will go crazy with it if yeah. he is like super involved with it, but he's just trying to blow it off. Like, Oh yeah, I don't know what's going well, on. He did a shitty job of that. Maybe if he just said, I, I haven't followed it and I don't know anything that would have done. Okay. But saying he wishes her well, dude, <laughs> what the fuck? This is the thing with the uh, Ghislaine Maxwell is that if, if she makes it to trial, if there is a trial, this will be the trial of the century. Yeah. And to act like you don't know about mm -hmm. it at all or what's going on with it is just yeah, complete right. bullshit. Because mm -hmm. I mean, this is the the amount of things that continue to come out about this is truly alarming. Like she is, she's no longer on suicide watch, but she's actually being moved from cell to cell because they are literally worried about yeah. assassins that might take her out. There could be literal people on the mm -hmm. inside that are working from some, you know, shadowy group that wants to see her, you know, no longer living. So mm -hmm. that, that alone shows you that, I don't know, man, I don't know if they're going to be able to keep her alive and, and that's crazy to say, but with Epstein and everything, we still don't know what happened with that. And well, if she fucking dies too, then they're going to have to answer a lot of questions because that's just ridiculous. I mean, once, but twice, it looks pretty obvious of what's going on. I mean, they better keep her alive because for the sake of yeah. all the victims of mm -hmm. Epstein and Maxwell, 
that, you know, we need the truth to come out about what really went on. We need to see what these two were involved with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had another man that came forward by the name of William Steele, who was friends with Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell. And he recently came out and stated that Ghislaine had actually shown him recordings of, quote, two prominent U.S. politicians having sex with minors. Oh, my gosh. Are you serious? That that right there is is if something I mean, like that. Comes probably out, the reason why they're wow. moving her from cell to cell is because yeah. there is there is 100 percent big dirt. names that are going to wow. come out of this. Damn. And there's going to be some big people that go down. We finally have some real proof. Absolutely. Because, I mean. We already know, you know, based on some of the flight logs and stuff that there are politicians that flew on mm-hmm. his plane. Mm-hmm. We know Prince Andrew about that whole situation. Right. So, you know, I, I don't know, man, that's going to be, we, we need these documents to come out. Um, but what's also interesting is that according to this William Steele guy, he used to actually steal jewelry and apparently Epstein and Maxwell would, would regularly buy his stolen jewelry and then give the jewelry as gifts to young girls that they were abusing. Yeah. Which again, this is just allegations that one individual is giving. We we don't have any way to confirm that this is true or not, but for somebody to come out and say this at all, yeah. and you know, we do know that you know they were abusing minors, then yeah, there's a good chance that this is true. Um, Ghislaine Maxwell and her lawyers are also currently fighting to get her released on bail due <laughs> yeah, to right. concerns about the virus. And right now no she's way. placed in isolation. No way. They're yeah, not going to No, they're not going to let her out. They're going to just keep her isolated. That would be so stupid. People would be so mad. Yeah. The, her lawyers want her to be uh, put on house arrest in a yeah, secret right. location. Yeah, right. I don't think that's going to happen. No. And this is also really weird. This whole thing about the judge. Yeah. So on July 19th, a man named Roy Hollander, who was a self-described, quote, anti-feminist lawyer. That's very odd. Yeah, well, I guess um, he was targeting, her name is Esther Salas, I believe, Mm -hmm. and um, she was a judge who I guess also happened to work on the Epstein case a little bit, but I believe she was, um, you know, a feminist and worked towards helping people with women's rights and whatnot, and this guy, like you said, was an anti-feminist, and I think that's part of the reason why she was targeted specifically. Okay. Which people also speculate, you know, she was targeted because maybe there's some connection maybe she because of something. the Epstein yeah. case, and which I think if I understand right, it was something to do with his finances. Yeah, it was, it was. a business related uh, part of. A, I think honestly, the media is like twisting it a lot more. Be like mm-hmm. Epstein, he's she's involved with that, mm-hmm. but I don't think it's necessarily that. I honestly think it's more so because she was a female judge who worked, you know, in a male dominated society and um, was a feminist, and this guy had beef with her and um, other people as well. It wasn't just her. Right. What's really sad is he went in there to assassinate her. But he ended up actually killing her son. Yeah, he showed up to the house dressed as a FedEx delivery driver. And when he got to the front door, uh, the judge's son, Daniel, answered the door and Roy opened fire on him and shot him dead and then ended up wounding her husband, Mark, as well. And it wasn't clear at first who actually committed the crime because Roy went on the run. However, the next day on July 20th, Roy was found dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound in upstate New York. Uh, about two hours away from where he had shot Daniel and Mark, uh, the judge's husband. So yeah, really tragic story. But in Roy's car, investigators found a list of at least 10 other names besides Esther and Mark, who Roy apparently had beef with and wanted to get revenge on. I wonder who they are. They're probably not putting that out there, huh? Probably not. Yeah, it's not very, yeah. (laughs) So investigators have now concluded that eight days before all this happened, Roy traveled by train to California to murder Mark Angelucci, a 52-year-old men's rights lawyer who is apparently considered a rival. What the hell? So he doesn't want women's rights and he doesn't want men's rights either? Well, I think he, because that guy was a men's rights lawyer, I think he felt like he was, yeah, like they had beef with each other because he was also a, a men's rights lawyer. I don't know. This guy's an idiot. Because like, yeah, like you said, he's what? an anti-feminist, but then he's also killing someone who's a men's rights lawyer. That is bizarre. Know. This is still under investigation too. So we don't have too many details about, you know, motive and everything else yeah. about why exactly Roy went and did this. But again, I think the media really drummed up a lot of, you know, 
coverage on this yeah. specifically because of the judge's to. Esther's connection to the Epstein case. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I mean, literally everything Epstein related just gets, mm -hmm. you know, blown up and, and, and all that. But I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what happens with this case and if more details come out about it, but let's go ahead and transition things to Danelle Lane and Michelle Wilkins, because this is an absolutely insane case. But before we get into that, we want to thank our sponsor for today, Aslo. In 2020, every business in the country is learning how to adapt day by day, but why aren't banks? Unnecessary fees or taking trip to your bank is the last thing business owners need to be thinking about. Aslo takes all the friction out of business banking instead of insisting you handle your banking as if the internet never existed. What's great about Aslo is they make business banking super simple and easy to use. They also offer a free business checking account with invoicing, bill pay, money transfers, and no minimum balance and no fees. Aslo is owned by BBVA USA, member FDIC, and because they make business banking easy and offer a fee-free checking account, Money Magazine called them the best business banking option for freelancers and entrepreneurs, which is why I recommend Aslo's because a lot of business accounts, you do have to have some type of minimum deposit or a minimum amount in your account in order to even get a business account. With Aslo, they eliminate all of that. So sign up right now with no minimum deposit at aslo.com slash mile higher and get a free copy of Aslo's small business starter guide. Again, that's spelled A-Z-L-O dot com slash mile higher and sign up with the free small business starter guide and no minimum deposit. Aslo.com slash mile higher. All right. So before we get into our case today, I do want to give you guys a bit of a trigger warning. This case is pretty graphic and upsetting, and you may not want to listen to it if you're pregnant or sensitive about that type of thing. It's just really upsetting in general. It's also going to be very controversial. I think you guys are going to have really mixed opinions on the end sentence. So please be respectful in the comments when expressing your opinion and understand it's okay to think differently than other people and you know share thoughts. Exactly. So that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. So in the spring of 2015, there were two couples that were eagerly preparing for the arrival of their unborn babies. We mentioned both of their names, Michelle Wilkins and Danelle Lane. Now we'll talk about Danelle Lane a little bit more here in a second, but let's talk a little bit about who Michelle Wilkins is. So Michelle is a 26 year old and her and her partner, Dan, recently purchased a home in Longmont, Colorado which is not too far up the road, I guess up, not really up the road from us, but it's up north of Denver, about 40 miles north of the city. It was a cozy little house with two bedrooms, one for them and one for their new baby. And they knew that they were having a baby girl and they were going to name her Aurora, which is interesting. That's a cool name. And it's also mm -hmm. a name of a city relatively close to us as well. But Michelle's friends threw her a baby shower and the couple got everything they needed for Aurora's arrival and her first year of life. Now, Michelle and Dan both loved the outdoors, and when they learned that they were having a baby girl, Dan told Michelle he was excited to buy Aurora her first pair of hiking boots. That's so cute. Isn't I it? Know. Yeah, it's, it's really sweet. Now, on the other hand, there was Danelle Lane, who was a 34-year-old former nurse aide who lived in Longmont as well, with her boyfriend named David Ridley, and they also had two teenage daughters. In 2014, Danelle told David that she was pregnant and that they were having a baby boy. And even though they hadn't actually been together that long, David was really thrilled and excited to be a dad. They ended up, they decided that they were going to name the baby James. Danelle had posted pictures of her pregnancy belly online, and she even sent David the ultrasound images. And just like Michelle, Danelle's friends threw her a baby shower as well. So in the spring of 2015, Danelle posted an ad on Craigslist for free maternity clothes. And at the time, Michelle was seven and a half months pregnant. So she responded to the ad and the two women agreed to meet. So on March 18th, 2015, Michelle drove to Danelle's house. And Michelle actually didn't know that Danelle was pregnant when she first answered the ad. Danelle answered the door and she came in her house. And that's when Danelle actually mentioned her pregnancy and how far along she was. And Michelle was actually a little surprised because she thought that Danelle should be showing a little bit more at this point. She said she was almost towards the end of her pregnancy, actually, yes. and she was barely showing, which to Michelle, this was a major red flag, but she kind of put it aside. So Danelle starts showing her all of the maternity clothes that she had ready for her. She asked her for her size, and then she put some in a bag for Michelle to take home. 
The women chatted for about an hour and Michelle was a really empathetic and open, warm kind of person. She reminds me, like she seemed like an empath type of person. Yeah, like absolutely. she was very deep and spiritual in a way and was very loving to anyone that she met and talkative. And one thing that Danelle noticed about and one thing that Michelle noticed about Danelle is that she seemed kind of lonely. She told Michelle about her daughters and said that they had some family problems. Michelle really felt like Danelle needed someone to talk to, and she was really opening up to her. But after a while, the conversation was still lingering on. You know, she did give her some free clothes, so she figured I'll stay and hang out and talk for a little bit. She's lonely, whatever. But eventually she was like, I've got to go. So she starts to say goodbye and heads towards the door. But before she stepped through the doorway, Danelle stops her and offered her some more free baby clothes, but they were in her basement. She explained that the baby clothes were for a girl and it was perfect because she was having a boy, but Danelle was having, but Michelle was having a girl. So it was a perfect fit. Michelle said she felt a little uneasy. She didn't quite know why she wanted to leave, but she was kind of afraid of being impolite. So she ignored her intuitions and just agreed to go look at the clothes. So Danelle leans across Michelle, pulls the front door closed, and then she led Michelle into her laundry room in the basement. So they start looking at the baby clothes and Michelle wasn't really into any of them. So she politely told Danelle that she wasn't interested and said, again, I have to go. And then she started turning and went back up the stairs. And this is when Danelle hit her really hard on the back. Michelle at first looked around and was kind of confused and was like, what? Was there like a spider on me or something? And Danelle said, yeah, and I think I got it. But then she just kept hitting her. So Michelle turned around, totally confused and held her hands up and said, what are you doing? But Danelle didn't stop. Michelle said, I just want to leave. I don't want to hurt you. And she tried to get through Danelle up to the stairs. But suddenly Danelle grabs Michelle, push her back through the basement door into the bathroom. But she was fighting to not be pushed in there and she couldn't end up pushing her all the way through the doorway. So she ended up shoving her into the back bedroom instead. And what's so creepy is the basement windows were all covered. No one could see in and she couldn't see out. Michelle continued to fight back as hard as she could. And Danelle told Michelle that she didn't trust her. And she said that she would call the police on her. Michelle took out her own phone at that point and threatened to call the police herself. And at that point, Danelle became extremely aggressive. She threw Michelle onto the bed and tried to suffocate her with a pillow in her bare hands. She even put her hands onto her throat and started choking her. That's so scary. So scary. And meanwhile, you were just talking about babies and thinking, oh, this person's really nice. And to go from that to this all of a sudden would be so shocking. I'm sure Michelle just had a bad feeling when she went down in that basement. She as did. soon as she noticed that all the, you know, all the windows were covered and everything mm -hmm. and she's being hit on the back. That's what's like so <sighs> weird too. Like, so creepy. I wonder why she even hit her on the back in the first place. Like, it's almost like she was hoping to like knock her down the stairs or something, you know, as they're going down, she's like, you know, Oh, the, is there a spider on my back or something? It's like, what, what is Danelle thinking? I don't, I don't even know. I mean, I wonder if she even really was thinking like, how much did she plan each step of this out? Yeah. Or did she just start doing that? Cause she didn't know what else to do and she was getting away. Yeah. It's, it's really weird. But anyway, Michelle continued to struggle with Danelle, and that's when Danelle smashed a lava lamp over her head. Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what we have behind us. This is obviously yeah. a huge lava right. lamp, so right. can't really pick that up with one hand. But some of those smaller ones are, you know, it's kind of like a wine bottle taking a, mm -hmm. taking that and then bashing somebody over the head with I it. I wonder if it was on. I don't think it was on because that would have like burned her super bad. Yeah, because that that liquid inside of it gets mm -hmm. really, really hot. So yeah, because it smashed the liquid went all over Michelle and uh, then Janelle picked up a piece of the broken glass from the lava lamp and stabbed Michelle in the neck. Janelle tried to then choke Michelle again, but her skin was too slippery from the blood and the liquid from the lava lamp. Michelle was fighting back and flailing her arms as wildly as she could keep. And she kept repeating, why are you doing this? She was just totally confused. That's the worst thing about it is mm -hmm. you're just so, yeah, you're, you're like, what the hell totally is going on? What did back. I do to deserve this? Mm -hmm. So finally, Michelle held up her hands and said, I don't know why you're doing this. I love you. That's a great example of who Michelle really is. I mean, in her mm -hmm. time of crisis and potentially a life ending moment, she's telling Danelle that she loves her. Yeah. And I've actually heard of people doing this before or just trying to connect with their attacker in any way. 
um, when it comes to empathy and emotion, whether that's telling them you love them or a lot of people will start telling someone about themselves. Like I have a mother who loves me. I have a child. I have a husband or just like telling, like humanizing themselves and trying to somehow persuade their emotions. And Michelle truly believed that. She believed what she was saying. She actually had a core belief that love is what motivates humans and connects us to all other beings. I completely believe that. I think love is the universal language. I believe it too. That's definitely true for sure. And in that moment, Michelle really believed that she loved Danelle. That's what she said. But Danelle responds to this by stabbing her and said, if you love me, you'll let me do this. In the chaos, Michelle, And in that moment, I think that kind of hit Michelle, like, let me do this. What does that mean? And she realized that she wants her baby. Mm -hmm. In the chaos, Michelle thought of her unborn baby, Aurora. She knew that she had to survive for her, so she fought back even harder. Danelle straddled Michelle and pinned her arms down with her knees, and then she put her full force of her weight on her windpipe. And that's when everything went black. I can't imagine how you'd feel like in those last moments. So scary. Oh my God. You're helpless at that point. She was unconscious. And you got to remember too, she's already been stabbed in the neck with a lava lamp. So she's got Mm -hmm. blood spurting out of her neck Mm -hmm. while this is all happening. And I'm sure in her head, just thoughts are, you know, racing through because yeah. And this is where things definitely get a bit graphic and gruesome. So Danelle got right to work. She had two knives ready and started making several deep cuts to Michelle's abdomen. Right there on the bed, she started performing an amateur C-section with the skill of a first-year intern. So essentially, Danelle makes a cut from one hip to the other in order to access the uterus, in which she then cuts through the uterus in order to lift baby Aurora out of Michelle. She then takes the baby upstairs and puts her in the bathtub, And obviously, if you just cut a baby out of the womb, you know, before they're ready to come out, that's going to put the baby's life in jeopardy. And at this point, Michelle was pretty far along in her pregnancy, very close to actually giving birth. So the baby was pretty developed. Yeah. And what's weird is that it seemed like Danelle didn't really care whether or not the baby lived or died at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, She wasn't trying to help it or make sure that it lived by any means at all. So at this point, Danelle casually texts her boyfriend, David, around 2 o'clock p.m. He was on his way to meet her for a prenatal appointment. She tried calling him a few times, and he picked up at 2.04 p.m. Danelle knew she needed more time in order to clean up the crime scene, so she asked David to run an errand at her daughter's school before picking her up. Her voice was calm and steady when she talked to David, and he had no reason to believe anything was wrong. I don't understand how people can be so calm and collected after they just did something horrific like this. That that to me is truly baffling. Meanwhile, in the bedroom, Michelle was lying unconscious, covered in blood. Blood was literally soaking through the mattress and into the carpet. And Michelle and Danelle's clothes were saturated in her blood, obviously, because, I mean, she's cut open, Mm -hmm. this extremely wide open cut. There's just blood pouring out of her. Danelle ends up pushing Michelle's limp body onto the floor, where she then stripped the bed and put the bloodied pillows into a sack and then tucked it under a crib in the laundry room. Oh my God, psycho. Danelle then did two loads of laundry, including bloody towels and sheets, and then she stripped off her clothes and put them in the trash along with bloody rags and paper towels. Danelle then put one of the bloody knives into the kitchen sink and then left the other in the bedroom. Meanwhile, David is on his way to pick up Danelle. And he had grown concerned about Danelle's pregnancy, was anxious for this prenatal appointment that they were about to go to. But she had refused to let him go with her to see a doctor and actually had kept telling him that she was moving the due date or that the due date was moving. Yeah. (laughs) She didn't say she was moving it, but she said she kept like giving him a new due date. Right. You can't like schedule your own due date. That's true. (laughs) (laughs) But by this point, he was a little suspicious because it had already been 10 months since she first told him that she was pregnant. So normally when you find out you're pregnant, you're around like four to eight weeks, sometimes even more. So it's been 10 months since then. So where's the baby? Yeah, that's what he's saying. <laughs> like, what do you mean the due date? You know, like, isn't it passed? She knew she had this lie to keep up. You know? Right, he, right. Where's the baby? Oh, God. So David arrives at the house and finds Danelle sitting in the bathtub with Michelle's baby. Oh and she was wearing only a bra and pants. She then told him that she miscarried. Meanwhile, this is 
almost a full term baby. Yeah. What do you mean by that? This doesn't make any sense. The baby was lying face down in the tub. So he ended up turning the baby over and checked for signs of life. And he saw the baby take a gasp for air. Which imagine this scene for a moment, you know, coming home thinking you're going to take your wife to the appointment yeah and she's in the bathtub with a baby floating face down in the tub he's got a lot of questions like what what the hell is going on so he decides to take danelle and the baby to the emergency room at the longmont united hospital and when they arrived at the er the placenta was still attached to the baby and she was wrapped in blankets oh my god unfortunately aurora did not survive and she was pronounced dead at 2 47 p.m which is just so infuriating considering she probably could have survived um, if she had gotten proper care right away and wasn't put in a bathtub face down. Which this right here already shows me that this was a very calculated plan because she's already telling David that, you know, I'm going to have this baby, but she's been pushing the due date with him Mm -hmm. till she had the opportunity to actually acquire the The baby baby that she was supposed to have that she didn't really have. You'd think she would have tried a little harder to keep her alive, though, if she wants to somehow play it off that this is her baby and continue on, you know, life as this is her child. And it's weird. Or maybe she wanted the baby to die so that she could have the sympathy of my my baby passed away, because it seems like a lot of this is about attention for her. And and you got to think, too, to go through the actions that she just did. Mm -hmm. Imagine how shocking and traumatic that is. I mean even for somebody that yeah. you know is seemingly planning to do this i mean it all changes when you're actually you know taking the knife to michelle and cutting mm-hmm. you know it's one thing to think about these things but it's another to actually fall through with them so i can only imagine her mental state was probably uh, not in a good place because mm-hmm. she's not really thinking clearly about everything so Danelle is still trying to tell the hospital staff that this is her baby and she's begging them please save my baby But shortly after she had actually passed away and she got the news, she just grew calm and distant and just sat there watching David carrying the baby around crying because he's thinking this is his child. Yeah, that's now dead. Yeah. So then Dr. Brian Nelson, who is an OBGYN, told the nurses to let the couple just grieve privately. So they left them alone. Danelle was given a drug that is given to postpartum women to kind of reduce their excessive bleeding. And at this point, the hospital staff had not examined her and they had no reason not to believe her. Well, yeah, because this is only minutes, you know, from them arriving to the hospital. So they're they haven't quite had time to really examine uh, Danelle to see like the extent of her injuries from Mm -hmm. this supposed miscarriage that she had. But Don't they have questions? I'm confused about why aren't they like, how did you miscarry at this term? Oh, I'm sure there be more like paperwork. I guess maybe they were just letting them have some time. Before. Well, yeah, because I mean, the first thing that they're dealing with is the actual baby. You bring right. the baby in, their right. attention's all going to be on the child. The child passes, so obviously they're not going to jump in and be like, all right, let's look at you, Danelle, and stuff. They're going to let them it's not a grieve that moment for a Wouldn't second. Wouldn't they have seen it as a just in a stillbirth? What? Yeah, a stillbirth. Stillbirth. Yeah, stillborn baby, right? I don't understand. This is a little confusing. So after a while, they did decide to take her to the postpartum unit and, you know, wanted to examine her. So Dr. Leslie Armstrong tried to do the exam, but Danelle refused. She said, don't take care of me. Just take care of him. I don't matter anymore. And it's unclear if Danelle was referring to David or the baby, who she was actually claiming was a boy. The hell? Yeah. She was majorly confused. By now, the hospital staff had alerted the authorities about Danelle's case, and the police told Dr. Nelson that they were going to need a court order before Danelle could be examined. You know, she has a right right to refuse that. Right. But eventually, they convinced her to do an ultrasound and a pelvic exam, at least, and they found no evidence that she was recently pregnant. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, I'm sure it was like immediate, like, wait a minute. Uh The doctor was like, whoa. Whoa. And the fact that she was denying it in the first place, I'm sure they were already starting to be like, what the hell yeah, is the going on Yeah, the story doesn't make sense. This, yeah. You don't look like a, a woman that just, you know, birthed a stillborn baby. Like, uh, I, and, you know, you're acting a certain way. I'm sure all the things just really click together and they're like, yeah. we need to get the police involved because something is very wrong here. So they're asking her questions. And then finally, Danelle tells the doctor that a pregnant woman had attacked her with a knife because she came to her house to get some free clothes. 
She claimed that she had struggled to get the knife but couldn't, and when the woman fell unconscious from the struggle, Janelle was forced to cut the baby out of the uterus to save her life. Which, it, think about that story for a second, yeah. it literally makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, as soon as they heard that, they're like, okay, this, they kind of figured out what was going on at that point, and yeah. she was arrested and taken into custody. So while all of this is unfolding at the hospital, Michelle is still lying in this random woman's house on the floor of her basement, completely cut up. And she finally comes into consciousness. And her first instinct was to get up, obviously, but you know, she had no idea what had actually just happened to her. And she had this really intense pain in her stomach, so she could not move. And that's when she looked down and saw the gash across her stomach. Oh my God. Yeah. And so she pulled her high-waisted pregnancy pants up over the wound. And then she started looking around for Danelle. She realized that she was alone and she tried to think of an escape plan. There was a window, but Michelle knew that she couldn't climb out of it in her condition, and she also knew she couldn't outrun anyone. So she decided the best thing that she could do was just to lock herself in there. So she managed to stand up, and her legs couldn't support her at this point, so she fell under her hands and felt blood just seeping everywhere. And at one point, this is really gross, but she did feel intestines fall out of her body. But Ooh. she was a very, very strong woman. She gathered all the strength that she had, and she willed herself to stand up and stumbled to the door to lock it. I can imagine how woozy you would feel. You're oh losing gosh. mass amounts so of blood. blood. You just put your intestines back into your body. Yeah, she's lucky to even be alive at this Seriously, point. I feel like I would just pass out and be mm -hmm. unconscious. Oh, you would. Yeah, the uh, amount there's of no way. The amount of adrenaline mm -hmm. you would need mm -hmm. is insane to be able to pull that off. Mm -hmm. And I think she was having motherly instincts too. Like she knows there's a baby, you know, she has to like, gather strength for her. Uh, and of course she doesn't fully know like what's happened. I'm sure she was so confused and disoriented at this point. Yeah. And her vision's blurry too, because I'm sure she's so lightheaded, like from the loss of blood that mm -hmm. the fact that she is able to get up and actually lock the door is truly amazing. Like, I don't think I could yeah, do that. I know. So when she turned around from locking the door, she realized that there were two cell phones left behind next to the bed. It was hers, and she assumed the other one was Danelle's. So she picked up the phone, and she fell back onto the bed and laid down on her back. She fumbled with the phone, but her hands were shaking so much. She was so dizzy, and her vision was blurry, so she really couldn't unlock it. And she accidentally swiped the emergency screen, which is awesome. That's why Apple has that. So That's honestly you know, a great easily, feature. Yeah. I mean, this is a great example. Yeah. Why. So she was able to call 911 at 2.41 p.m., and here is the phone call. Pretty intense. <laughs> You can tell she's just barely hanging on, but she's on such a mission to, you know, get help. It's honestly amazing that she's able to stay conscious and, and give Think. that information to the yeah. dispatcher. Like, because I, I mean, if she had been unconscious, I mean, there's a good chance she would have bled out and died. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah, if she wasn't able to gather the strength to, to make that 911 call, 
I mean, she literally saved her own life because of that. Mm, she did. Michelle knew that it was important to stay awake and alert, so she tried to keep talking on the phone as much as she could and not doze off. So she locked the door, but she didn't know if she was actually alone in the house, and she was also scared that someone could still be there. The dispatcher encouraged her to stay awake and reminded her repeatedly that help was on the way. And miraculously, Michelle was able to describe the neighborhood that she was in and the house's color to help the first responders get to her. It, it, it just goes to show that she, it's almost like she kind of knew that she needed to take note of that when she went yeah. over there. Like mm -hmm. she was almost so prepared for what could happen, I which I mean, so many of us are oblivious to yeah. things when we go to meet people or, you know, go to random strange places. You're and, good about that though. You pay such attention to detail. Like things I could have no idea. I'd go to someone's house. It could be pink and I have no idea. Like I don't pay attention to stuff like that, but you always recall all these details and it's like that stuff is so important, especially if you are in a situation where you feel a little uneasy. That's such a good tip. If you ever feel unsafe, start taking note of where you are, what's going on, anything that you can so that those you know details are fresh in your head. Absolutely, because it could just save your life. So finally, the first responders were able to find her and Michelle actually heard them ring the doorbell. And she told the dispatcher that, yes, this is the right house. I'm downstairs. So you can hear her get really excited when they're there. Um, as you can imagine, that would be just such a relief. So the paramedics rushed Michelle to the Longmont United Hospital, the same hospital that Danelle's at. And when Dr. Leslie Armstrong saw Michelle, she was nearly dead. Mm -hmm. She had been stabbed several times, but obviously the most distressing wound was in her abdomen where she had been sliced open from hip to hip. Oh, so gross, dude. Michelle had stab wounds on her head and neck and she was covered in bruises. Her face was swollen and puffy. And by this point, she had lost more than half the blood in her body. That's insane. Uh huh. If she did not get up and get that cell phone and make that call, she'd be dead. 100%. She'd be dead. Because Danelle wasn't going to tell anyone that she was there. No, no. I mean, Danelle is still trying to keep keep going with her lies. Mm -hmm. At that point, the ER called in Dr. Nelson because obviously there was trauma to you know that area. So you got to get an OBGYN in there to and take a look. This is the same doctor that was just working on Danelle. Yeah. So when Dr. Nelson got to her, Michelle was awake but completely delirious. And he saw right away the laceration across her abdomen and that her small intestines were out of her stomach. She said that she was she was literally holding them in her hands. Michelle obviously needed emergency surgery, so they rushed her back. Oh, my God. They contacted Dan, her partner, and when he arrived at the hospital, he was really confused and obviously terrified. He couldn't get he couldn't even get answers from the staff about Michelle or Aurora. Janelle and I were literally just talking about this, that oftentimes fathers don't get answers and stuff. Crazy stuff will be happening to a woman giving birth and they don't want to like scare you. So they'll just leave or not tell you what's going on. And I just can't imagine how scary that would be. I mean, he was super, super confused. They're about to have this baby, their first baby. Yeah, It's just heartbreaking. When he finally learned what had happened, everything felt surreal. He couldn't believe what was happening. He didn't truly really believe it until he was finally able to see Aurora and hold her in his arms. Oh, so sad. He ended up bringing Aurora to Michelle's bedside after surgery, even though Michelle was unconscious. And this whole time, Michelle still doesn't know, you know, the fate of her child. Mm -hmm. But when she woke up the next morning, she was connected to multiple tubes, including one down her throat. And the clock said 730. And for a moment, she thought it was night. But then she quickly realized it must be morning. At that point, she took a few deep breaths trying to stay calm. But as she paced her breathing, she started to remember the nightmare that she had lived for the day before. And that's when it hit her like a ton of bricks that Aurora couldn't have survived the brutal attack that had happened. She frantically started asking the nurses to remove all the tubes so that she could speak. Dan was at her bedside and all of a sudden the memories just started flooding back. She looked at Dan and he just knew what she was thinking, what she wanted to know. And he just said, she didn't make it. Michelle just started screaming over and over again. Why, why did this happen? Oh, it's so upsetting. I can't imagine after carrying this baby and being so excited to have her just ripped out of you like that. That's just the it's probably therapy one of the, that you would need. It's so upsetting. Yeah. I mean, it's probably one of the worst things that could happen. Mm -hmm. So Michelle was in the ICU for five days after the attack while her and Dan grieved the tragic loss of their baby girl. They continuously asked each other why this had happened. And obviously there's no answer for that. You know, like you can't really find a reason for it. 
But two days after Aurora's death, they were allowed to spend an hour with her. And Michelle lovingly dressed her baby. She was able to read to her and sing her songs. And they both remarked that there felt like there was the presence of their child there with, with them. <sighs> That's heavy. That's really sad. So it didn't take long for police to put all the pieces together. I mean, here they have this woman whose baby was cut out and they have the woman who had the baby and showed up at the hospital. Right. So police are starting to interrogate Danelle about the attack. Danelle claimed that Michelle attacked her first. She said Michelle had turned on her and tried to slam her head into a wall. Danelle screamed to try to get her neighbors to help her. And that's when Michelle, she said, tried to stab her with a knife. And that's when the struggle ensued. Danelle also said that Michelle tried to bite her and that's when she choked her. Notice how she's saying she tried to stab me. She tried to bite me because she has no evidence of any wounds on her. Right. Because Michelle was such a kind hearted person. She was like barely fighting back. I mean, not yeah. brutally. Which it's very weird because Danelle, her explanation for why she cut the baby out is because she was worried that Michelle was going to die. And that makes absolutely yeah. no sense because... Mm -hmm. Danelle's also trying to claim that she is the victim in this case and that Michelle was the one trying to kill her. So you cut her baby out? Right. It, it makes no sense. Yeah, that's not a defense no. wound that someone would get. Right. A cut from hip to hip. Like, oh, no. I accidentally did that when I was fighting her off. Yeah, absolutely no. not. And then I removed her child and yeah. brought it to the hospital. Yeah, because then she tries to act like this hero. Like, I had to get the baby out in order to yeah. save the baby's life. And well, She's deranged, dude. She she's was telling the police up. that oh yeah, I was going to try to revive the baby. And she even admitted to the police that David believed she was pregnant with her baby, but that she had been pretending to be pregnant for over a year. And what a it's psycho. Yeah. And no one called her out and was like, where's the baby? Right. And also Danelle had her tubes tied after her 19 month old son drowned in 2002, Damn. which this death was ruled an accident, but I don't know, man, mm. that's, it's a little weird, a little suspicious. Definitely. So all of that night and the next day, police worked to collect any evidence that they could from the crime scene. And it was a mess over at Danelle's house. I mean, half a human's mm -hmm. body's worth of blood is all over the bedroom. Yeah. So they found bloodied sheets, pillows, a mattress top, and clothing. They also searched Danelle's internet history, and she had searched for information on the female anatomy and... However, she didn't specifically look up anything regarding C-sections. But police did find images of medical drawings of the female anatomy saved on a tablet, which were used on the day of the attack. So while the police are investigating and she is awaiting trial, Danelle is being held at the Boulder County Jail. And one month after the attack, she was given phone privileges. And she knew that the calls were going to be recorded. She ended up making about 300 calls altogether. Some were to her mother, but most of them were to David. And during these calls, Danelle told him how distraught she was to be in jail and how difficult the experience had been for her. Oh, it's just playing that victim card the entire time. Uh -huh. And during these hours of conversations, she never expressed guilt or remorse for the attack on Michelle or for killing Michelle's child. On one of the first calls to her mother, Danelle said through tears, quote, it's been so hard not being able to call anybody, not being able to talk to my family. All I do is think about the girls, which she's referring to her teenage daughters. It's just like, who cares? Yeah, man? seriously. So when the trial actually started and was going on, Danelle called David at one point telling him how stressful the day had been for her. Oh, boo. She said, I was so drained. I was so tired. Oh my God. And he actually comforted her and said, whatever is said, and whatever happens, I love you and I miss you. Man. That's insane. So the district attorney, Stan Garnett, who's actually prosecuting Janelle's case, noted that there was an extreme lack of remorse and apathy, which really surprised him. She, she seemed to show no understanding of the enormity of the pain she had caused and instead only ever focused on how the whole ordeal affected her. Some other strange things that came out from the calls that she made from jail included a call with her mother where Danelle talked about an 18 year old woman who had been disowned by her own mom through a letter sent to the jail. Danelle actually cried on this phone call saying, I don't understand how mothers can't be moms. I don't get it. So these phone conversations that Danelle is having actually was very baffling to psychologist Max Wachtel. He explained that during the attack in the preceding months when she pretended to be pregnant, 
Danelle had to be, quote, completely psychotic and just out of her mind. But during these phone calls, she sounded how any person would sound who missed their family. She wasn't sorry for Michelle or Dan or Aurora. She only seemed to care that she was being locked up away from the people she loved. And what's crazy is Danelle's family ended up apologizing for Danelle. She admitted that her crime, but she herself never admitted to her crimes and never apologized. And in a statement from Danelle's boyfriend, David, he expressed condolences to the victim's family and also said that Danelle is a sweet and loving person and a good mother, but he believes that she needs some mental help. Yeah, no shit. He said that there is a condition where women think they're pregnant and is so strong that their mind and body changes. I am shocked that this was not brought up in the trial. So defending her again. Yeah, yeah. These people are all sick. Even if she does have that condition, what does that have to do with you yeah. going, oh, and therefore she went and killed someone and took someone else's baby out of their womb? Oh, okay, that makes she sense. She should get it passed. Like, what? Poor her. That doesn't mean anything. No, doesn't mean anything. Yeah, and poor Michelle this whole time, like Danelle's trying to make herself out to be the victim. Meanwhile, the real victim, Michelle, is struggling to just put her life back together after mm -hmm. this horrific event. It took months after the attack before Michelle was even ready to talk to the media about what had happened. And she ended up opting for an exclusive interview with none other than Dr. Phil. And on the show, Michelle talked about how uneasy she felt with Danelle. She had that gut feeling. She wanted to leave. And this is really interesting because I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. I can definitely relate to this. I'm a huge people pleaser. She didn't want to be rude and was worried about, you know, hurting a stranger's feelings. And that's what kept her back from following her intuition and leaving. And she gave the advice to other women to listen to that inner voice of wisdom, which is so important and very challenging. When something arises, try not to allow the fear of being impolite or hurting someone's feelings stop you from listening to that intuitive voice. And during the episode, Michelle talked about how she was really grateful for Aurora, even though her life was tragically cut so short. Dan and Michelle believed that Aurora was the most beautiful thing that they had ever laid eyes on. Michelle said that she was a perfect baby. But Michelle still remains a positive person, and she has told Dr. Phil that she has not lost faith in humanity. She said that there was one, for that one person who caused her so much pain, Thousands of people wrote her letters, made donations to help with expenses, sent her emails and Facebook messages, and offered their comfort and support. Michelle said that if that doesn't invigorate your hope in humanity, I really don't know what would. Such a positive person. She is. To she, continuously look at the positive yeah. of things and not dwell on you know, the negatives and the trauma that she had just went through. That's pretty amazing. And she would have been an amazing mother. Throughout the trial, Michelle kept this perspective, believing that she and Danelle were actually connected through their humanity, which is really a beautiful thought. Hard to, for some to wrap their minds around, but it's, a major, but it's amazing strength that she had to have this outlook on everything. But as she listened to the testimony and listened to the evidence that was stacking up, she did say that she was feeling a lot of anger, which how could you not? How Seriously, could you not? I'd be so pissed. Me too. Through testimony and evidence, it became clear to Michelle that Danelle had multiple opportunities to do the right thing. After the attack, Danelle knew that Michelle was still alive, but instead of trying to help her, she just rolled her off of her bed and left her in the basement, leaving her on the floor. And this is really interesting, but Michelle said that when she told Danelle that she loved her during the attack, that Michelle felt that at that moment, Danelle kind of paused and was possibly considering her choices, but she chose to go ahead and move forward with the attack. Yeah. And it's just like, what drives a person to do this at all? Like why, why do this? Well, it's clearly her not being able to have a baby and, but she really thought that she was going to be able disturbed. to cut this baby out, claim that this was in self-defense and Michelle died. And then she just get to keep this baby. Like, I mean, I don't know how much she was actually playing through her thoughts and really thinking everything through, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're unstable enough to do something like this, how far are you planning ahead? Is she really thinking through each right. thing? I mean, we don't know how far ahead she was even planning. Well, I mean, it seems like she didn't know about Michelle's partner, Dan too. Cause in the end, I mean, even if this was how Danelle described it, some type of self defense, she cuts the baby out, save the baby's life. Mm -hmm. Cause Michelle's, you know, dead. Yeah. She's not going to get to keep the baby at the end of the day. Dan's going to keep the baby because he's the father. So right. what law there's no logic in, in this attack whatsoever. Yeah, and I see what this you're saying. Like, was she planning to 
try to move forward and actually convince everyone this was her baby and somehow like hide Michelle's body. And I don't know if she even thought that out though. Did she plan further than cutting the baby out? I don't know. I don't think she even thought about the fact that the baby has a father and a family and people are going to come for her. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like she was thinking much at all. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense at all. And, and how did she think that when Pete, you know, she tells her story of self-defense when police are like, okay, well, where's your defensive wounds at? Mm -hmm. And there's none. And yet Michelle's stabbed multiple times. She has this huge cut. Like it, it just makes, I mean, it's clear to me that Danelle was not thinking mm -hmm. clearly about or plan this out mm -mm. In, in a methodical way to actually pull this off in any way, shape or form. This no. was kind of a, maybe an impulse, like in the moment type situation. Now I'm sure most of you feel one way about this and feel that she is fully guilty of a murder here and should be held responsible for that. However, there actually was a lot of controversial debate over this case and over legal rights of unborn fetuses. Right. So the Boulder District Attorney ruled that because the coroner could not find evidence that indicated Aurora had lived outside the womb after being removed from Michelle, Danell could not be charged with murder. That is insane and makes absolutely no sense. Which... It, it doesn't make any sense because we already know based on the witness testimony that there was a gasp of air mm -hmm. from the baby. Yeah. To yep. know, yeah, there's a, there's a gasp of air. So that right there, I believe proves that wrong because the baby was clearly alive and conscious if it's able to take a breath of air. So why are they saying that you can't charge Danelle with murder? I just don't understand that at all though, because the baby was still alive inside of her and was going to be born. Yeah. And I know it's going to bring up the debate about abortion. And I mean, the difference here, though, is Michelle had no choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. She was attacked and her baby was ripped out of her and murdered. I don't really see how this is even a debate or has anything to do with abortion and those types of laws. Yeah, because like you said, <clears throat> that has a lot to do with like, you know, choice versus life. But right. this, you know, Michelle was wanting to have this baby. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it as, okay, it's Michelle's body, it's her life, it's her kid. Then if she wants to have this baby and someone took it from her, mm -hmm. then I think that the, yeah, the discussion of murder should be there. Yeah, it should be a murder. I just don't understand how there was any debate about it. Yeah, well, it, it caused a lot of debate because the case went all the way up to the state capitol which forced lawmakers to decide if they could charge Danelle with murder or not of this unborn child. How is this even a question? So here, here's the thing with it. So killing a fetus is considered homicide in 38 states. But in Colorado, homicide is defined in state law as the killing of a person who had been born and was alive at the time of the homicidal act. Now, this debate was hotly contested on both sides. State Republicans and anti-abortion groups fought for the murder charge for Aurora, while state Democrats and abortion rights advocacy groups fought against it. I'm sorry, but what the fuck were they thinking? I don't understand how, why would you fight against a murder charge? Well, I, there could, well, there could be some issues with abortions here. I think the, the way that this was going and what the Republicans were wanting to do could have, could have limited people's rights for abortions too. Cause if, you know, that gets really complicated, but obviously in abortions, there's a debate whether or not you're killing a child or not there. So I think the worry for Democrats was, is that if we give this, then it could lead them down the road to take away all abortion rights. Okay. But I think that's stupid as fuck because these two situations are not even comparable. I mean, this is a, this is an attack. This is a planned murder. I don't get it. I don't get what they were possibly fighting for. I think that's just stupid. Right. And that's why the Republicans introduced legislation to try and change the law to allow the murder charge, but Democrats blocked it. And this was the Colorado Republicans third attempt to pass such a bill in March of 2015. Actually, Michelle's family returned a donation made by Republican lawmaker Gordon Klingenschmidt after he said that Michelle's attack was a punishment from God for legalized abortions. Okay. He, that's sick though. Yeah. He also said, quote, this is the curse of God upon America for our sin of not protecting innocent children in the womb. Little extreme. 
very extreme. And I'm glad they returned that donation. That's fucking weird for them to say that to her. But ultimately, Danelle was charged with four counts of felony assault, attempted first degree murder, and unlawful termination of a pregnancy. And the last charge, unlawful termination of a pregnancy, was a compromise between Colorado Democrats and Republicans, as well as opponents and supporters of abortion rights. I think it should have been murder. In July, Danelle pled not guilty to all of those charges. And during the trial, the prosecution argued that Danelle's actions were deliberate and well thought out. During the attack, she seemed determined, calculated, and took steps to prepare. I mean, even learned enough about C-sections ahead of time to be able to perform one. Right. However, Danelle's defense attorney, Jennifer Beck, argued the opposite. She attempted to prove that Danelle's actions were impulsive and reckless and not at all pre-planned. She tried to make the case that Danelle was guilty of attempted manslaughter rather than attempted murder, which obviously manslaughter carries a, a much lesser sentence than premeditated murder does. And so that's why they were trying to prove that charge as opposed to murder or the attempted murder charge that she had. Her attorney also argued that Danelle didn't plan for what to do after she had removed the fetus, which to some extent, I believe that because mm -hmm. she really did seem like, oh, shit, I actually got the baby out. What do mm -hmm. I do with it now? Yeah. But during the trial, the prosecution and defense each won small victories along the way, making the outcome of the trial all the more uncertain. The judge denied the defense's request to move the trial outside of Boulder County due to the excessive media coverage and allowed for the inclusion of nearly 100 photos of the bloody crime scene along with multiple items covered in blood, which were obviously big wins for the prosecution. This was a really big case, especially here mm -hmm. in Colorado. Yeah, there, was there was a ton tons. of coverage on it. Mm -hmm. The defense got a win when the request to block testimony about Aurora's death was granted. The request was made on the grounds that the government didn't have to prove the cause of Aurora's death because she wasn't the victim in the case. This meant that the jury would not hear testimony about the autopsy performed on Michelle's baby. Danelle chose not to testify on her own behalf, and the defense called no witnesses for her during her trial. I mean, How, who's going to get up there and yeah, defend her ass? Seriously. However, the prosecution called multiple witnesses, including the 911 operator who took Michelle's call, the police officers who interviewed Danelle, a computer forensic specialist, and medical personnel who cared for the two women at the hospital. And actually, Michelle ended up giving testimony herself during the first day of the trial. She was super emotional, but stayed calm and kept her composure while describing the most disturbing details of her attack. And we'll put a little clip in there of her talking about it because it's, I feel like it's important mm -hmm. to hear some of the things that she went through from her own, uh, in her own words. So I could. It's, is it fair to say you didn't think you could climb out the window? Yes. Okay. Did you try to shut the door? I willed myself to stand and stumble towards the door. And, um, you know, my vision felt really blurry. So I feel like. You know, I like closed the lock or put the lock and when I turned around next to the bed, we're still both of our cell phones. I guess it was hers. I saw mine and another cell phone. And so I just stumbled back to the bed and laid down on my back to, and picked up my phone. Okay, so you picked up your phone to call 911? Yes. And were you able to call 911? I was. Okay. The prosecution also played the recording of Danelle's 50 minute interview with police and the jury listened as Danelle explained how Michelle had attacked her and that she had only cut the baby out of her in order to save its life. And during this time that they played this interview, Danelle cried for the first time. After they played this recording, the prosecution rested their case. And in February of 2016, the jury found Danelle guilty of attempted first degree murder unlawful termination of a pregnancy, two counts of first degree assault and two counts of second degree assault. After the verdict, Michelle thanked the police officers, civil servants and first responders who saved her life. Michelle had also forgiven Danelle as part of her personal belief system and said that it just never entered her worldviews that someone could be this cruel and value life so little. Michelle believes that despite the law not passing that would have allowed a murder charge for Aurora's death, that the court has in fact given her justice. Before the sentencing, Danelle's family actually begged the judge for leniency, and a letter from her teenage daughter was read out loud. Also during the sentencing hearing, Michelle chose to address Danelle directly, and looking directly at Danelle, Michelle said, quote, 
I chose to use my time to address you directly, Danelle, because up to this very moment, you refuse to acknowledge us, the victims of your violent actions. I am a compassionate person. This is the foundation of the beliefs from which all others grow. It is clear that you need healing, and my sincere belief is that you get it. Amazing. Seriously, so what an strange. amazing human. God. Mm -hmm. Michelle also referred to Aurora in her statement, repeatedly calling her, quote, my daughter. They actually had a large photo up of Aurora, who was almost a full-term baby. And the picture was up during the entire statement that Michelle made. And in the photo, Aurora actually appears to be sleeping peacefully. Also in Michelle's sentencing statement, she stated that she had trust in the court to uphold the law and provide justice. And she concluded her statement by asking for the maximum sentence for Donnell of 126 years in prison. Donnell did not make a statement uh, during this hearing. So in the end, even though that law did not pass, Donnell was sentenced to 100 years in prison, which I believe is justice, you know, as much as they're going to get. And this was on April 29th, 2016. As far as Michelle goes, in the weeks and months following her attack, she had been forced to focus on her physical recovery instead of being able to focus on her own healing and grief mentally. It took two months for her to make the full physical recovery, and it is possible for her to have children one day if she decides to, but the emotional healing will take a lifetime. As part of her healing process, Michelle posts on Facebook often. Around the time of Aurora's due date, Michelle posted a touching message saying, Today I spent time in the studio making pottery. I bought a new car. I spent time with my sister. I told Dan I loved him. All the big things and the little things add up to how we spend our life. How present we are from the pain and the joy. Nothing could have been more full of both than one week containing Mother's Day, Aurora's due date, and the two-month marker of her passing. I am sometimes overwhelmed with gratitude for having spent seven beautiful, uncertain months with her, but some days are just still really hard really tough, but it's a blessing that I can count every day. I love you, Aurora. I always knew you would be my teacher and I'm so humbled by all the lessons you've brought me. And thank you to my family and friends who have supported me through this tough time and let me take all the space I needed. At times, Michelle felt like giving up. She was overwhelmed by the exhaustion and the trauma and grief. Some days she said she slept in and didn't have any energy for anything else. I mean, totally depressed. But some days she felt more like herself and would go out on a hike and do other activities she enjoyed. And that's how she got back to her normal self. She was diagnosed with PTSD from the attack, which is definitely understandable. And sometimes she still has, you know, episodes of panic, sudden flashbacks to that nightmarish day. But during those times, Dan has always stayed by her side and provides her comfort and support. Michelle has also recognized that Dan has suffered from his own trauma. Even though he wasn't the one who was physically attacked, he did lose his daughter that day. So in many ways... He was Danelle's third victim. Yeah, I mean, she completely destroyed this mm -hmm. family. He did. Well, destroyed, you know, the life that they thought they were going to have. Obviously, right. they're going to recover and hopefully go on to have kids in the future. But Destroyed all their plans. Yeah, absolutely. However, they are still continuing to plan their future together, but they still grieve for their daughter and the family that they never got to be. And even after everything that she has been through, Michelle still has compassion for her attacker. On a fundraising page set up to help her with her recovery, she wrote, please keep myself, Aurora, the medical staff, the police officers, and Danelle, the attacker, who needs healing as well, I'm sure. In your prayers, meditations, chants, loving th thoughts, loving vibrations, however it is you express your heart. Oh, I love that. It's so beautiful. In the aftermath of her attack, Michelle started teaching ceramics at a local studio, and one day she hopes to open a healing center. In the meantime, she plans to travel, continues her study of meditation and yoga, and she attended graduate school. She was accepted into a program to receive her master's in counseling. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That is that's awesome. really powerful that she's taking her trauma and yeah. trying to use it to help others. Mm -hmm. Taking her life back. But she needed that time you know, before starting school to help heal before pursuing her dreams. And she took that time, which is amazing. Recently, she said, I still wish to support a community with a center that serves people's healing for growing organic food and supporting my art and pottery. But how can you pour from an empty cup? I will continue to focus on my own healing and allow that to blossom in its own time to something that can nourish everyone. Gosh, amazing woman, Seriously. really inspirational. Seriously. I mean, for such a tragic, horrific yeah. story, I mean, mm -hmm. at least there's, you know, Michelle, like she's still here on this planet to yeah. 
you know, spread this message and teaching she, others how yeah. to forgive. And it's, it's amazing. She's really inspiring just how she survived this. I mean, she was so close to dying and, yeah. and you know, you probably would have thought in any other circumstances that she would have. I mean, like we said, if she was just minutes later calling or, you know, maybe she wouldn't have been able to stand seconds after she locked that door and she laid back down. I mean, it was like everything had to be, she had to gather that strength to save herself. And I just think that's so amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's super inspiring story and just, you know, the lesson of forgiveness too, mm -hmm. you know, it's so easy to hate somebody after yeah. somebody does something like this mm -hmm. to you and takes your child from you, but to be able to reconcile all of that and not only and forgive that person for what they did to you in order to, you know, live a better life yourself and hopefully inspire others to do the same. And just, it's amazing. I mean, I don't know what other word to describe it. It's well, just, that's so what's so important about forgiveness, right? Is forgiving them for you. Yeah. It's not about the other person that you're forgiving. It's being able to move on and like cope with that trauma, come to peace with what yes. you cannot control mm -hmm. and how, you know, you, it's up to you how you, choose to move forward with mm -hmm. whatever you've experienced, but it's really inspirational that she is, you know, saying to wish her well and to bring her good vibes or prayers or whatever. And hope that she gets help yeah. versus I hope you rot in prison, in hell, yeah. which I mean, a lot of people would take that approach yeah. and that's fine too. Yeah, like, sure. you know, whatever a victim goes through, it's, yeah, you have it's every their right, right to, to angry, act man. however they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's crazy is that this, this case is called a fetal abduction. Mm -hmm. This is a actually like, more common than you would think. Like there's a lot of, of cases out there of fetal yeah. abduction that happen similarly to so how this scary. played out. And as it, you know, if I were pregnant, hopefully you're not pregnant listening to this, but if you are, I mean, I'm sure that's just horrifying to think about. Yeah. I, and I mean, this also is a good lesson for people about using Craigslist. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you don't always know who you're going to be meeting up with. And a lot of people set traps on there like this. And it's important to, if you are going to, you know, meet up with someone you don't know that someone knows who you are, like preferably that you don't go alone at all, yeah. but at least telling someone where you are and what's going on is, is really important. And just trying to be safe about the type of people you're meeting up with or meet in a public area. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's what I that's, started doing. That's so true. Like back in high school, I started like buying and selling computers on Craigslist. I and that shit. one time I did go to a guy's house and it was a little sketchy. And was, I was that like, the time on Valentine's day that you were late for Valentine's yeah, day? And remember I, I, so I, mad at you. I lied to you. I was like, Oh yeah. Um, I remember I'm, that. I'm at blah, blah, Oh, I was blah. so pissed off. It was yeah. like our first Valentine's day. Or yeah. We like, second. I went to this guy's house like <laughs> somewhere and yeah, it was, it was definitely a little bit sketchy. And then something, I forget why, but we ended up meeting up again at a McDonald's. Cause I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to your house again. Yeah. Dude. It's like, creepy as fuck. So yeah, if you do transactions on Craigslist, just do it safely. Either have yeah. them come to you to your house or just meet in a public even that, space. Though, don't even have them come to your house. Public space is where it's at because then other people can see if they right. do something. Make yeah. sure other people are go to around. a parking lot or you know a restaurant, a McDonald's, and <laughs> do your transaction there. So you know, lots of lessons from this one for yeah, sure. Definitely. But you guys will definitely have to let us know what you think about this case. You know, what do you think about? the you know murder charge not being brought into this i'd yeah. like to hear your thoughts on that I'm and sure you guys will have opinions on that absolutely but we'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there if you enjoyed this episode of the malhar podcast definitely let us know give us a thumbs up if you're watching on youtube subscribe on itunes uh and, and again i just wanted to point out if you want to support the show and help yes. us guys i know a lot of you watch us on youtube only if you wouldn't mind going popping over to itunes specifically is is probably the best place and just hit and subscribe that would be really great because yeah, just it helps our show, it helps us grow, it helps us gain yeah. new new uh, listeners. So YouTube views don't count the same way that uh, iTunes and Spotify right. do. So if you can, even if you don't end up listening to it, just subscribe. Yeah, just, it just helps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But with all that being said, we will see you guys next week. Stay safe and stay woke.